There are people that don't realize that uh, we live in an era where everything's etched in amber. So move accordingly. You're getting very philosophical. <laughs> yeah, bro. Out, out, out the gate. gate. Yeah, out the gate. Thank you for coming on the show, brother. Been Thanks waiting for, for this for a while, long time. Thank you, time. bro. Appreciate you. Absolutely. So we've known each other. The audience doesn't know this. We've known each other now at five, six years. Yep. Have you always been like a measured dude? What do you mean? Like if you were a stock, if you were tra MAV, that place, Garrett, if you were on the stock exchange, yeah. you're just a steady tick. Yeah, that's, uh, yeah. There's people out here, they're just like Ethereum. They're just fucking. The volatile. <laughs> yeah, the volatile. <laughs> it's too volatile. Your BPM I, is pretty. I pretty much feel the same <laughs> yeah. every day I wake up. Yeah. Just about. That probably played to your advantage though. You're 44 now, yeah? 42. 42. I mean, 43, 43. in like two weeks. I feel like that volatility is kind of cool when you're 18 to 25. Sure. You're the life of the party. Yeah, yeah, like, yeah. You know what I mean? You're the funny, you're yep. that. Uh, but good decisions compound. For sure. And bad decisions compound too. That's a great point. I always say this way that like, the same people always appear lucky because they're actually creating luck through decisions. What it really is, is consciously or unconsciously. I do it pretty consciously because I was taught as a kid. Yeah. I was raised in a house that was a gambling house. And what you learn in cards is an innate skill that I would love to teach my kids if they would sit down and put the fucking phones <laughs> yeah, down for yeah, a second. Yeah. You learn to manage risk versus reward in real time. And some people are unconscious about it. I'm conscious with it. Yeah. Like I'm always going, Go to this party, go to this event, eat this food. What's my upside versus my downside? Some people sure, yeah. don't do that, and they the, that thing compounds and it ends but up But there's happening. another thing that you're talking about. As new information is coming in, the power of the pivot. Like, new information comes. I gotta change. We're pivoting. The, but there's some people that are just like, both feet, they, they can't pivot or adjust or... 100%. But you, that's like, that's, that's life. life 101. Are you good at that? That's one of my greatest strengths. One of the gifts God gave me or like life destiny gave me was that. Was that from a early age, child of immigrants, we learn how to pivot. The whole life, getting the green card, getting in the country, you just have to figure, I have a PhD and figure it the fuck out. Did you know that young or were you just doing it? Were you just figuring it the fuck out? I just remember as a little kid, I was always seeing the world through like this lens. Like I'm watching something and I'm like, oh, I, wa I want that. Remember like we're around the same age. So like when Slam Magazine would come out or East Bay would come out, I would see like upcoming this Christmas, Air Jordan 11, black and red, the breads. And you would get it months in advance. And the visual imagery of that, of like, all right, it's 149.99. Like how do I get 149.99? And I remember one of my older friends, Homer, he knew if you call this number, you can call East Bay in advance and get the bread 11s before everybody else gets them. This is news to me. So he would just get on the phone. Hi, what's your name? Janet? Janet, hi, how are you, Janet? You know, it's, he would obviously anglicize. Oh, it's, um, it's Richard. Oh, hey, hi, Richard. His name's Homer. Oh, hi, Richard. <laughs> um, so I, I noticed that the, the black and red 11s are coming out in, in December, but what I'd like to do is, um, I'd like to order two pairs in advance if that's possible. You can take my credit. And it's like, okay. Wow. All these examples of like, hey, there's something that I want. And me and my friends, we just like, Figure it out. And did your parents put fuel on that? I just I know remember. you live with your dad. I'm yeah, so yeah. So, so your just, mom went to India, right? Yeah, my back. mom. My, my mom was in India. Then she she was getting her medical degree. Then moved came to back. New York at NYU. Then then had to do her residency in Stockton. Yeah. So it was like a slow transition to then all of us to be together, right? So I just remember all of this. Like, man, we are we are working so hard to put our little squad together. I just remember as a child being like. I'm gonna have to be the person that provides the stability or the answers. I gotta figure it How out. How old, like child, like what? That's a, that's a heavy thought. Third grade probably, like third, fourth really? grade. Yeah, I'm just like, I gotta figure, yeah, I'm gonna have to figure this out. There's all these things I want. And what did your parents tell you was the way to get that, those things? So. Because you know, Indians are usually about like edgy. Edu oh, bro, we are chasing. Hardcore. Yeah. Like hardcore about it. Hardcore. Too. Greatness or nothing. Yeah, exactly. yeah, bro, we're samurai. Yeah. 
You know what I mean? Where yeah. you just like, I didn't get into the right school. Just da, ah! you know, like, <laughs> straight up. Like, yeah. no, there's no number two. Yeah. You know that Nike commercial, winning isn't for everyone. That's about Indian people. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> like, it's like, yo, love isn't for everyone either. Yeah, yeah. like love is conditional. Like yes. you gotta, you gotta fucking try out for my for sure. love. But all jokes aside, like my parents' generation, they're they're survivalists. They're the generation of survivors. So your income is fixed. Every dollar out the bank account is one less dollar the family has. So they were that. Me, my sister, our gener we're, we're the dreamers. Like we're the generation of, okay, we're here. What do you want to do? For, like from Bread Elevens to a Netflix special, what do you, what do you want? And so that that's like what me. But how and did your my... parents react to that? Were they like, Go oh, home? oh no? Or were they was, like, what the hell is bad? Talking yeah, it was about? very bad. Yeah, it was very bad. What was he doing? By the way, my dad is an organic chemist. He Got works, it. yeah, the, the department. Yeah, he works with the department, the Cal EPA, and the Department of Pesticides. Got it. His whole career, like thirty five years, retired in twenty seventeen. He he gave the full thirty five wow. pension, everything, which is like a such an old concept. What he saw was that there was, a, there was a particular lane that you could go, which was basically like medicine, law, or computer science. These, are, these three fields can give you huge upside. The problem is, by the time I came of age to actually execute that, the whole playbook changed. The game changed. The game changed completely. That was the tension between me and my parents. I could see the world changing. There's this thing called the internet, YouTube, uh, the arts, media, there's all these different ways where I think there's like, I have a gift and there's an opportunity. But the biggest thing was they were like, I, s I think you have a lot of potential. That was the hard part for my parents. They, they, they really did see the potential in me. So they're like, why are you pursuing this thing that doesn't have a guaranteed yeah, outcome. outcome? And I was just like, I don't think, I think I'm a mid-level physician. <laughs> Like, yeah, I'm, a, mid, I'm not even, I'm not a, a top position. tier. Yeah, I'm not an all NBA position. neurosurgeon. Yeah. I'm a Caribbean med school grad. Like, I'm a pharmacist at the local CVS. Yes. Do, like, I'm a mid-level. I'm not the best of the best. I have this gift of gab or whatever it is. I think this is my gift. The tension really was where, as I was growing up and I was in undergrad and then going to college and I finished college, and I took the LSAT. You graduated from UC Davis. I graduated right? from UC Davis. But I took the LSAT and I applied to law school and I was sitting on a wait list offer from UCLA and USC and I let it expire. And that kind of was the, the real crossroads moment. Well, you had to, you're like, yeah, fuck at it, 25, we're, fuck it, I'm going this way. I'm going this way. That was a crossroads moment and I knew that there's no going back. So I have to figure this out. What were you doing then? Just open mics and stand up. I was just in everywhere? LA trying to make, yeah, trying in to LA, make it everywhere, make yeah. It. I mean, the way it worked for me, and I'm glad it happened this way, I went to UC Davis for four years, and I tried to become the best comedian I could at my college. Did you even know how to write anything? Like, how were you write, coming up with the- Material. With your bits and, and material? Were you making it up on stage or were you writing? It was a little bit of both. It was just like, I was scribbling it in a notebook, and then I was also just writing on stage and recording it. It was really great that I got to figure it out in a small market, in a small town, where pe and also where I wasn't being recorded. I was able to fail publicly without it lasting forever. forever. Do you still love hitting clubs now? To this day, yeah. I think stand-up comedy is the greatest art form. You're also friends with some of the greatest comedians ever, but yeah. I am friends with some of the greatest <laughs> comedians ever. And yeah. I'm, more importantly, I've been on journeys with them to see them come up with an hour. In your mind, what is the job of the comedian? All right, so this is my personal perspective on it. Of course. The starting baseline is you have to be funny. Like that's the necessary condition. If you're not making people laugh, you're just giving a speech. <laughs> you're lecturing people. So the baseline, the necessary condition is funny. But the only thing that matters, the only currency that matters is POV. 100%. It's, it's but it's just like with music. You may not like rock, you may like classical or jazz or you know what I mean or folk sure, sure, sure. we could argue all day about which one is better but the the bottom line is Elton John's POV is different than 100% uh Post Malone's POV yeah, and it's, it's the, that the, that's yes. the part and I'm inter I'm interested in that I agree with you that's like when you listen to him and what's the new POV yeah like I'm not here to litigate or adjudicate what your POV is I just I'm in I'm like in. I love I want to give it a shot yeah I, I love the form there are now I wouldn't say a lot, but there are a few 
a few Indian comedians totally. that I know in my head. Yeah. I don't remember Indian comedians when growing up. So there was one, Russell Peters, and he- Oh, he, yes, of course. What Russell did that was so incredible is he basically opened up the world to our cultural POV. Got it. He made was, the world see in, in yeah, culture in a different way. In a different way. Yeah. So America has been, when we look at culture in America, it's oftentimes seen through a black-white dichotomy. 100%. And so I talk about this in the special, where there's black America, there's white America, then there's Bejistan. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, my man, where are you from in Bejistan? Where, yes. where, where's, where's your family from? Philippines. There so it was just like Indians, Latinos, Filipinos, wherever the fuck Bruno Mars is from. Just all the, <laughs> you know, that's Bejistan. If you're, if you're a country that's been bombed at some point by the United States government, you're, you know what it is. There's this third wave culture. And over the past 15 years, or I would say most recently, the, the past 10 years, we've seen this influence of, I, I call it just Bejistan culture. Whether that's Bad Bunny, whether that's Maluma, sure. whether that's me, like it's sure. th it's this third perspective um, of immigrants by choice. But what's interesting about everybody from Bajistan is we knew what the empire is and we signed up okay. accordingly. And that's an interesting perspective on the world. How do I articulate that POV? I'll give you an example. If I'm going to open it up, it's not even just Indian. It's like, are you open to this or not? There's collective spirit, there's individual spirit. My first freshman roommate, his name's Luis. I remember I had a, a Jordan Wizards throwback. He wanted to go to a party. I'm like, take it, bro. Rock. Rock it. I knew he was gonna get beer on, whatever, but it's like, what's mine is yours. I had this other roommate, I'm not gonna name him. I've gotten in trouble for naming people in my comedy. <laughs> Let's call him Tyler. In the dorms, he had head and shoulder shampoo. He noticed that in the bathroom I had used a little bit of it. And like I shampooed my hair. And he had an intervention with me. And he's like, hey man. Don't touch my shit. Don't touch my shit. And I had this whole beige stand, you're cracking up. I, I wish there was a reveal on him. He's, cra he's <laughs> laughing at the premise of this. So I walk in, I'm full Indian dad. I take a quarter out. I go, oh, I took your shampoo. I slam, a, I go, here, here's 25 cents. I'm sorry for taking an eighth of an ounce of your shampoo. There's a huge fight in the dorms. There's Bajistan and there's Caucasia. Yeah. And Caucasia is like, hey, boundaries, <laughs> sir, this is mine. And me and Luis and everybody from Bajistan is like, bro, we're in this together. Yeah. Like we got to pool resources. What the fuck are you talking about, Tyler? Yeah. Now, technically, technically I was wrong. You yeah. should ask. Sure. But I'm also not wrong. What the fuck are you talking about? It's, it's fucking <laughs> shampoo. <laughs> what are we doing? What are we doing? That's my POV. Like there is this interesting collective spirit that's that and that that's very new and interesting to talk about in america which is hyper individualistic yeah like this country has lost its fucking mind there are people in this room whose dogs have better health care than their mothers sure you people have lost the fucking plot no shit yeah i have i have nothing in common with you <laughs> and i stand on that yeah I like agree. this is insanity i agree with yeah this. let's talk about specials how do you get to Get people on a comedian getting to an hour is really fucking hard work. Yeah. When you are going for an hour, do you have a thought meaning, like the title? Yeah. Uh, off of this off head. Off of this head, yeah. Did you have that title and then go like, okay, well, I'm gonna build a show that fits that? Do you start with one bit and then you build multiple bits? Or is it like I have this yeah. theme that I'm thinking about? For me, it starts with like, there's two things that I'm trying to do, which is, you gotta just vomit everything out. Just like a great novelist or whatever, you have to write a lot. And then the good edit. stuff happens in the edit. That's the whole game. It's like, get it out, and then you chisel it away. As you're chiseling it away, I've found the muse presents itself. History is unfolding, the election is unfolding, my place, you know what I mean? Where I'm at in my life, and then you meet that moment. Like it, it's it. I can't articulate it, but it reveals itself. The, you have to. This is going to be about. What is? And this then you about? come up with the title. Then you come up with the title. Yeah. When you're doing um, specials, like everything, there's like creative control, ownership of what you say, what you do. Yeah. And then it spills out of outside of business. How do you think about that? with your show is is Netflix involved? Or are they like don't say this? Don't take. Yeah. Are they looking at the edit? Is it all you? And then how do you translate that outside of comedy also? So funny enough, what you guys created here at Spring Hill 
and what Lena did with Helmingrad actually inspired me to start One Aces K. Really? I remember when you guys were first starting Spring Hill, just having conversations with you and seeing the way you guys were moving. I always have felt sports and music are ahead of Hollywood TV and comedy. And if comedians, if we just embraced what the athletes and the musicians are doing, our pirate ship will be ready for the uncharted waters to come. Mm -hmm. One of the things that y'all did at Spring Hill that I thought was so brilliant, which was you take, say, the athlete or the artist. In the old model, Doritos, Coca-Cola, all of these people would buy ads against True. a Mav Carter, a LeBron James, whoever. What you guys did by becoming owners of your own destiny, your own asset, and the ancillary assets was the whole game changer. What you own is what they cannot take away. Mm -hmm. Okay, how does 186K, we have to start a production company, but we have to put up the bag. So then when I call Sony or I call Rideback, I go, I'm putting up half. Mm -hmm. Will you put up, just match me. Will you put up half and then let's do this together. Yep. But then it also got me to think about hey, what are the advertisements that are sold against my name and likeness? And so what you guys have done with product and consumer product is what I've done now with tea. There was a company in New York City called Kolkata Chai Company started by two brothers, which is one of the first South Asian brick and mortar storefront tea stores in the, in the country. And I started to see these two brothers. I was like, oh, they're making our culture. They're taking it from the margins to the mainstream. Yep. Tea is a is a like a form of commiseration, For of sure. love, of just gupshup, banter. Yeah. Like it would be appropriate that we'd have chai right now and just, and sure. just shoot the shit, like yeah. literally on the stoop or here. And so what they operationalize is an omni-channel business. They have brick and mortar just for like the experience. And then they also have it online where they can just ship it from Manhattan to the Midwest. I was like, I'm gonna buy this. I'm gonna buy this company. And it's because of the inspiration you guys gave That's me. That's amazing. Yeah. That, that is... Amazing you've done that, that you're thinking that way. The most important thing, man, that, that you taught me and that like your generation of entrepreneurs, when I include you, Tyler, Lena, which is fundamentally what we provide, which is culture, and we argue about who owns the culture, we don't end up buying it. Yeah, for sure. So we can argue about it all day, but I was like, I have to be actively part of the change. For sure. And that means who is putting up the bag? Who's paying for the wedding? The biggest thing you're doing there is you have to do a mindset switch, which is hard, but we're getting there, which is when I grew up, it's like, like you, it's like, find a way to make some money. Just find a, any yeah, way. But that's survivalism. That's survival. Yeah. But what you're doing now, when you buy the tea company, you're flipping is like, no, it's not, you're not buying that to make some money. You're actually giving up money and you're not playing a long I'm game. I'm taking on a loss, yeah. You're taking a long yeah. game. Long game. Of like, build something that has equity and enterprise value, which is way different than making money. And what I've noticed with the musicians, but specifically the athletes, this may be the first generation where we see multiple dozens of billionaires. I may be talking to right now in five or 10 years, the owner of an NBA team. Mm -hmm. Like that's going to happen. Yeah. And that that's gonna completely shift the paradigm. Sure. Culture is the water, but Mav Carter may be the pipe maker. Yeah. You actually might own the pipes that everything is piped through. If you look at sports, athletes, NBA players are paid handsomely. Yes. 40, 30, 20, 50 million dollars but they don't own anything. Correct. And the 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 people who own the assets, they own the team. Yes. The teams go up in value. They pay the players. The players actually are decreasing in value with every year, every day, because you get older yep. as a player, mm -hmm. and at some point you're too old to play. Totally. 20. Show business like this too. You used to be hot, and now you're this or whatever. That happens. Yeah, yeah. But the the, the asset of the, the value of the teams have never went this way. Correct. From this beginning of time. Yeah. I think the NBA is 77 years old. The team's values have always been it's crazy. Yeah. up and to the right. Yeah. Literally. And it's just a way of thinking that we yeah. have to get to, and it takes Correct. time. It's Correct. hard. It's really hard but to get But I there. do think this will be the generation. And we've been, you and I have been in rooms that we were never allowed into. Of course. Before. But when you look at, when you go into those rooms, and these are the rooms where, like, you know, the, our conspiracy theorist friends are right. There are rooms where it's like, 
Oh man, this goes back generations. Yeah, they go too far. They, they go, go a little bit too they far. Go way they go way too, too far. far. By the way, friends, family. <laughs> yeah, family. family. Just WhatsApp, yeah. But there definitely but are rooms for sure. Here's what it is, though. There are places where uh, the system is designed for a, a s- select group of individuals and their progeny to, to pass that thing down to. Sure. But this is the first generation where you're seeing, I'm seeing for the first time in my life, black studio ownership, black team sure. ownership potentially, and that completely well, changes the paradigm. First, you just have to get the mindset, and we're, that's, I think we're almost there. We're just like, yeah. we're there where enough of us yes. have the mindset like, oh, it's yeah. not just about getting the million dollar deal. Yes. Or the million dollar Netflix show. It's like, oh, how do I yes. get that and do something else with it? Or how do I get, to, like, think about it in a different way? Correct. Where I don't have to always just be about, fuck you, pay me. We all, That was always our mindset, which right. is like, fuck you, pay me. And they were like, the record company is sure. happy to pay you. Sure. Do it, pay, pay you more, pay you more, because our equity value is going up. Correct. I will say, uh, being a child of, California and Silicon Valley did teach me that, though. They had it. Inadvertently, you got lucky. I got very lucky. To, to be there. That. Just to be in Just that Just to place. be there, to be around that, to absorb that. To they be got like, that this very... is the way you have to think. Yes. You have to be in the pipes business. 100%. You have to be in the tea business. It doesn't matter. If we start thinking that way, it's a, it's a it's like a game changer. For sure. The whole thing changes. Absolutely. Yeah. Appreciate this you. This is bro. beautiful, bro. Thanks for the inspiration, Thank man. You, bro. Yeah, man.